Hello darlings, I hope you are all right and keeping safe and doing well. I've been contemplating making this video all day, I've been worrying should I, shouldn't I, I've uh, been wracked with nerves actually because I wanted to do this video ever since I started making videos which was only a few weeks ago but I knew at some point that I was going to make this video if nothing else just so that I could document um, probably the most challenging thing that I've ever dealt with in my life which was the death of my mother um, I've been thinking about it for quite a while and um, I finally decided I was going to take the bull by the horns and I was going to do it. Um, I'm hoping that people will watch the video, of course I do, that's why we make videos but if nobody does at least I know that I've documented how I feel so that in years to come I can look back at it and it will be a reminder of where I was back in a certain time and hopefully in the future I've worked through a lot more of my grief and I'm at a better stage with it all and it will be a reminder how far I've come but of course I do hope that people watch this video I hope that perhaps it touches somebody somewhere, that it helps them in some way. Perhaps they might find similar things with their own grieving, in my grieving, you know. But uh, I am nervous about doing it because I do have a bit of a phobia about public humiliation. I am worried about making a show of myself or what people will think because I'm going to be absolutely honest I'm going to be absolutely true to how I feel I think a lot of people when they're going through grief put a brave face on things and they tend to say what they think that the person that's talking to them wants to hear I'm going to say exactly how I feel and it might be hard for some people to listen to and I am frightened of people's reaction to it because I don't want people to think badly of me. Who does? You know? I think we all care really even though we don't want to show it but like I said I'm, I'm going to be straight with you all and talk to you and tell you about what happened to me and how I dealt with it and how I didn't deal with it and see what you think you know anyway my mother she passed away on the 8th of September 2012 and the bottom dropped out of my world to be honest with you you know when you hear people talk about being heartbroken some people poo poo it you know you can get over things but my heart really did break that day and probably at the time one of the most important people in my life left me and I couldn't believe it. It was really such a shock. At the time, I just couldn't believe it had happened. And when I look back, I think to myself, well, why were you so shocked, you know, Lou? You should have known it was coming. Because it was obvious, you know. But I don't know whether it's better to know that someone's going to pass away or whether it's a complete shock I think they're both equal to one another you know that there's pros and cons with both 
but it was such a shock to me. I really just, I couldn't believe it. Um, she was ill in the run up to her passing away. Um, I thought, oh, you know, because my mum, you see, I must say this, perhaps I should have said this at the start, I always knew that my mum would not last as long as she should have done because my mum had a lot of illnesses all through her life from being a child. Um, her main illness was bronchiectasis and then she was also, she had celiac disease and she had anemia diverticulitis, um, she wasn't very well at all and I always knew that like I said I would never have her as long as I should have done but she was only 67 you know I always had it in my head that oh she'll be in her, her 70s and mid to late 70s that's when I'll lose her. To lose her so soon I just was gobsmacked you know and I felt robbed that was the initial feeling I felt robbed and it felt so unfair you know that I didn't have as long with her as I thought I did um, another thing that really troubled me at the very start was that I didn't get to say goodbye to her. Um, I'd had a phone call of my sister and she said, you know, you need to come to the hospital. And I drove and <laughs> I know it's naughty, but I went over the limit, you know. I, I got tried to get there as quickly as I could. And uh, when I went into the hospital, I went to the place where she was, the ward. And uh, the nurse asked me to wait. She didn't take me straight through. And that's when the alarm bell started to ring. And uh, it was at that point that she then took me to this little room. And my dad and my sister were there. And they didn't even say a word. They just looked at me. And I looked at them and I just knew. And I just felt my stomach drop. I just... It was like, you know in the movies when they do those scenes where everything stops except the main character. It's like, it just freezes. That's what it felt like, like the world had stopped. I'd missed her. I'd missed her at the last minute. She literally just died. My dad and my sister were with her when she, um, her heart stopped and the crash team were called and my sister later told me that it was like something off a movie, you know, when, when the people come running and the machines and, you know, they've got the, uh, those things that try and start your heart with, you know, and, um, they did fight for her. But um, she went and um, it was, I felt really bad about that, not getting there. I've since come to terms with that, you know, because from what my, my sister's told me that she said to me, you know, I, I'd have rather have been you. I wish you'd have been there when she her heart stopped and I'd have been like you a little bit too late, she says, because it was really quite traumatic that and I can imagine you know my sister um, she suffered for quite a long time after that with terrible dreams and nightmares you know replaying that situation anyway um, after they got her together my mum you know we went to see her and I've got to say you know the only other dead body I'd ever seen was my nanny Rose my mother's mother and she looked like a proper dead person, which I know is daft, but she was in a coffin and she was like, you know, cold. 
But my mum, when we went to see her, she was still warm, you know. She looked alive. She looked like she was snoozing. And I kept looking at her thinking, are these people right? I mean, are they sure? She's, I mean, I, do you know, I even asked the nurse. And, I, you know, I think back, I'm so embarrassed. But I actually said to the nurse, are you sure she's dead? Are you sure? Because she doesn't look dead. And this poor nurse, I mean, this nurse, she probably comes across this a lot, you know. Um, because the people that she looks after are very, very ill. You know, my mum was very, very ill at, at the point that she passed away. So she's probably used to it, you know, like an intensive care nurse. But she was like, you know, sweetheart, you know, she's she's gone. I couldn't believe it. She was still warm. And uh, she still looked, you know, alive. And I remember looking at her and just taking her all in. You know, taking note of the moles on her hands. I'm really sorry for getting upset. Um, I'm really sorry if you can't hear me properly I'm going to try not to get upset um, yeah I, I remember looking at her and taking her all in uh, noticing what her fingers looked like uh, where the moles were on her hands the colour of her skin you know, what her eyelashes look like. It's like I wanted to absorb her. You know what I mean? Anyway, we we spent some time with her. And, uh, of course, then we went home. And I remember getting outside of the hospital. And all I could think of was they're going to take my mum to the morgue now. Which I know is a very morbid thought. But the thought of my mum going in the fridge, because you know my mum, she was always cold. You could take her to ho on holiday. She she'd go to Spain, you know, with her brothers and sisters. Or I mean, I took her to Turkey once, and she was cold. She was chilly, you know. And talk about dark humour. But I I was almost laughing to myself, you know, to think that she. She's going to go to the morgue now. And, you know, she's had this fear, this mortal dread of, of cold, you know. And I just didn't know what to do with myself. I, I, I was I starting to panic, you know. I thought, what am I going to do? You know, what what are you supposed to do? Because that's the thing with with death. They don't. No one tells you what to do. It's not something that you learn in schools. I mean, I'd never had a death in my close to me like that before I've never had to you know deal with it and I was starting to panic and all I could think of was ringing my best friend Lulu so I rang her from outside the hospital and I'm smoking cigarette after cigarette you know pacing up and down the car park in the hospital talking to her and and my friend you know she she was so good you know as I said to you on on a video ago my best friend she's always been there for me you know when I really needed her and she offered to come up and everything I said no I'm all right I'm with my dad and my sister but it was just I don't know it brought me down from the panic you know talking to her and then we went back to my parents house and we just sort of walked around for a few a few hours, just dazed, drinking cups of tea, which is what us English people do, you know, if if in doubt, put the kettle on. And um, just talked, you know, just, we were just dazed, you know, it's like, like a bomb had gone off, we just walked around like zombies. And then the next few weeks or so, things went very much in the days, you know, going to the uh, funeral directors, organising the funeral. It would have been very difficult for us, but my aunts, my uh, mum's sisters were very good. My auntie Jean, she was alive then, and she came up from Cornwall, 
and my other aunt helped us, you know. And um, that's where it all started. It all started really after the funeral. Because up until then I was numb. I, I, I couldn't believe what had happened. And then um, it hit me full force. Like someone had just come and punched me full on in the face. I was so angry. You know, so angry. I, I couldn't believe she'd abandoned me, which I know sounds pathetic. Because, I mean, at the time I was 39 years old, I had a husband, I had a son, a mortgage, a job, I wasn't a child. But I felt abandoned by her. I couldn't believe she'd left us, you know. Because, you know, when I was a kid, and we used to watch those, you know, those movies made for TV, and they'd all, always have some sort of sadness, some trauma about them, you know. Uh, some woman, the husband runs off and takes the kids with him or, you know, there's a terrible divorce and uh, the woman, you know, loses touch with her children and all these things. You know? And our mum used to say to us, you know, I'd never leave you girls. You know, I'd hunt, you know, to the other side of the world. No one would ever take you girls away from me. She was very loving with us. She was very um, protective of us, you know, and... I've heard her say, and I, she actually said to us on so many occasions, you know, you girls are everything to me in my life. And I just couldn't believe she'd gone. And I know that's ridiculous. I mean, it's illogical, isn't it? You know, she had no choice. Her heart stopped and she died. You know, she didn't leave of her own volition. She'd still be going now if she could have done, but... I feel I felt like she'd left me and this void opened up inside of me this huge black hole because my mum was larger than life um, she was quite a tall lady and quite a plumptious lady so she was physically quite imposing but she was a force of nature, my mum. Even though she had a lot of illnesses and a lot of woes, she was so powerful. She always seemed like a warrior to me when I was a kid. That's how I looked upon her. She was my hero. She just fought against anything. She worked so hard. She worked so hard, I can't tell you how hard she worked. And she always knew what to do. And she always did it right, and she always got it done. And she was just such a forceful person. And she was so kind and loving and caring. Her family were everything. Her girls, her husband, the home, you know. My mum loved us so much. And she always made us feel safe, you know. When I was a kid, I, I listened to other people, you know, as I've got older, and you make friends and you chat to people about your life. I'm very sad to hear of anybody of anybody else who never felt safe when they were kids, you know. I always did. No matter what happened, I knew as soon as I got home, and I told our mum, she'd know what to do, she'd know how to sort it out, and she'd do it, you know. There was always this lovely feeling of safety and warmth at home, no matter what was going on outside. And then she was gone. And it was like all that safety, that safety net had gone. Because my mum was captain of the ship as far as our family was concerned. You know, she was the ruler. She was the one that was in charge of everything. And it was just like... Um, just like someone did, he chopped the chain of the anchor and the boat goes adrift. And we just, I know it sounds ridiculous, but we didn't know what to do with ourselves. Which is, it, it, it's madness, isn't it, to think that somebody, I knew I loved her, I knew I respected her, I knew that I needed her before she passed away. 
but it wasn't until like she died and she left us that I realised the extent of it. And I think that's the same for most people. You know you love them, you know you need them, you know you respect them. But when they're gone, the full force of how you much you feel those things for that person hits you. And it's, it's uncalculable, there's not maths to deal with it. And this huge void, this huge void opened inside of me and I just didn't know how I was going to fill it. You know, I just, I just, sorry, I just didn't know what I was going to do. I, I really didn't. I've never felt so unsafe and so um, lonely. I mean, I've got my dad, I've got my sister, my husband, my son, friends, relatives, but my mum has been the only person in my life to truly understand me. Just one look, the tone of my voice, my body language. My mum could tell something was up over the phone. And sometimes, even without the phone, sometimes I'd get a phone call and she'd say, what's wrong? It was almost as if we had um, telepathy, you know. And I was scared, you know, when she left, when she died, because I thought there's nobody left that knows me, that understands me, who knows what to say, what to do, and when to do it, and when to say it, you know. And it, and I, I was very lonely, and I still am to this to this day, you know, eight years later. Like I said. It, uh, and she's coming up to eight years on the 8th of September and I still feel lonely because the void is still there and um, you know but I've come to the ter I've come to terms with the fact that no one will fill it at first I thought somebody might fill it but no it's unfillable <laughs> The void's still there, but um, I have come to terms with that. But um, the loneliness, the um, that 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 still prevails, and I think that will always prevail. But I think for me, the worst thing about my mum's death and grieving for her has been the anger. That's the thing that I think's been the most destructive for me um, I'm so angry and it still resides and that worries me a bit sometimes because I think it's been nearly eight years and you'd have thought that would have dampened down a bit because I know that there's supposed to be stages of grief isn't there in that I feel stuck I think I've moved on with other things because now when I talk about it I don't automatically cry Sometimes I laugh, you know, about some of her antics because she was a very, very funny woman. And she used to play up sometimes and things she did and said. It, she was quite quirky, my mum. She was good fun. But with the anger, I'm stuck. And I don't know if I'll ever be able to completely deal with that. Because I am angry. It's just not fair. Oh, that sounds pathetic and I'm embarrassed to say it to you guys but it's not fair you know she suffered so much and she had so much hardship in her life and um, I was hoping that when I was a bit older I would be able to make it up to her somehow you know take her places, take her on holidays, buy her things, you know, do things with her. But of course I can't. And I, I must admit, even now, I, I look at some people who are my age, or older, and they've still got their mothers. And I do get envious, and I, I, I do get really, really angry. 
because I think, well, why have you got your mum? What's so good about your bloody mother? Why haven't I got mum? It's terrible, isn't it, really? This is why I find it so hard to talk about it sometimes, because I genuinely am embarrassed sometimes. Some of the thoughts that I think, you know, some of the feelings that I have. But I, I am angry. I mean, a few weeks after she passed away, her doctor, uh, Dr. O'Brien, she contacted uh, my sister and she said that she wanted to see us both because when my mum died, she's the specialist for my mum's uh, bronchiectasis. She was a bit shocked that we were so shocked, you know, when mum died. So a few weeks after she passed away, we went to the hospital to meet up with my mum's consultant. And she said, explained to us that, you know, she'd asked to see us because we seemed to be so shocked about my mum's death. And she said, well, she sat us down and she said, did you not know your mum was chronic? And I, and I was like, well, what do you mean by chronic? Doctor, I don't understand what you're on about. She says, I told your mum back in 2007 that her disease, her health had become chronic. She obviously didn't divulge that information to you. Well, the penny dropped then. Back in 2007, my mum had been told that um, her health had become very bad, chronic, and that she would only have a handful of years left. She, uh, she never told us. She never breathed, never breathed a word. I'd never even heard of the word chronic before. And uh, she was told in 2007, and of course, I got pregnant in 2007 with James. And I think it was about the same time that she was told what she was told about her health and so I think that the reason she kept it from us cause was because she didn't want to worry us and also because I was pregnant and she never mentioned it and Jay was four, four and a half or no a bit less uh, July yeah he would have been four and two months when she passed away so she kept that to herself. That's why I call her the warrior. Because she kept all that worry to herself. So as not to upset us. You know, trying to protect us. Trying to make it easier for us. I couldn't believe it, it blew my mind. And the consultant, Dr. O'Brien, she couldn't believe it. You could tell by her face. She couldn't believe that my mum had kept that information to herself for over four years. You know, and I said to the said to her, you know, what was it that got me mum in the end? And it was her heart. Because of all the illnesses that she'd had over all those years. Her heart had to work so much harder because of all the other illnesses that finally had given up. And she'd never had problems with her heart, you see. Because my mum couldn't drive, you see. So I used to take her to... My sister and myself, we used to take her to all of her hospital appointments and everything. And we'd never heard heart mentioned, but um, with the bronchiectasis and all the other illnesses that she'd had, she basically wore out her heart. And I also found out something else from Dr. O'Brien as well, that I'd always assumed that because she had pneumonia twice when she was um, a teenager, that's what had affected her lungs and brought on bronchiectasis because my mum never smoked. My mum never even had a puff on a cigarette, you know. She was quite uh, an interesting case. My mum used to do a lot of work with um, research 
um, doctors and things and Dr O'Brien and my mum because she used to have to go into hospital twice a year for intravenous antibiotics and she always used to bring all the students you know and she'd say oh Christine I hope you don't mind but I'm using you as a teaching tool again and my mum used to laugh because my mum had a very interesting she was a very interesting case of bronchiectasis it started with diphtheria and I'd never heard of that. In fact, my, it was Dr. O'Brien who'd actually researched my mum's case. And um, it was actually very interesting because I found out so much from this doctor about my mum. And, and there's something else that really surprised me with the doctor. She'd built up this very long relationship with my mum. She'd been uh, looking after her for years and years and years. And you could tell that she really cared about my mum. You know, some I've heard people say, oh, people are just pieces of meat to doctors. No. This woman really cared about my mum. You know, and thought a lot of her. In fact, something I found out as well after the funeral and everything had been done, that some of the nursing staff had come to my mum's funeral. I didn't know because I was just, well, I, I was in a world of my own on the day of my mum's funeral. But, um, yeah, my aunt told me and my sister that um, some of the nursing staff, quite a few of the nursing staff, actually, and the first Christmas that we had, when I went up to the grave that one day, they'd actually travelled because my mum and dad and my sister lived in a little village they actually travelled and put some um, floral, and floral arrangements on my mum's grave in the village cemetery you know so she really was well thought of and it was like a second home to her at the hospital that she used to go to so I suppose they all knew her you know but um, like I was saying uh, the anger I think that for me has been the hardest thing and the most embarrassing thing is the fact that I'm so angry at her that has calmed down a bit as the years have rolled on because of course you know she didn't mean to die but you know it was very intense when she first passed away I was so angry at her I remember saying to Don once, you know, if she was, uh, if, if I could, I'd bring her back to life to kill her for dying in the first place, you know. I just, I felt, I just couldn't believe she abandoned us. I felt like an orphan or something, you know. It's ridiculous, isn't it, the thoughts that you have. But, um, yeah, the anger. The anger at the whole situation, the anger that she was taken away from me, it is still there. I, I, I still feel cheated, but um, hopefully one day it, it will go. Because I've noticed my grieving has moved on in other ways, you know. Like I said earlier, when I talk about it, I don't automatically cry. Sometimes I laugh when I recall memories from the past. And I still think of her every day, but not a hundred times a day, you know. And life has to move on, doesn't it? But um, it is, it is such a hard thing to cope with. It's... Um, so hard but you know I go up every week to visit her my dad and my sister they don't go as often I don't think they need to go I do I, for me I like going I find comfort from going to her grave tidying round, putting fresh flowers on and all that I think it upsets my dad and my sister you know, whereas it, it, it helps me. Yeah, I still see her every every week and I always tell her that I love her and 
or with whoever I miss her. Even though I know she's not really there, that's just the body. Because I know she's around me. Um, she's up at my sister's house. And she does come and visit us a lot, you know. She makes herself known at my sister's house. But, um... Oh, it's a... It's a hard thing, isn't it? But, you know... Like I said, we we all have to go through it. But um, one day, hopefully, I'll be able to move out of this place that I'm at the moment, and the anger will subside. I hope so, because it's been going on for quite quite a while. I did consider going back to therapy because I had therapy back in 2014 when I had my last breakdown that was work related stress and we mainly concentrated on work my work situation and the stress I was having from that we didn't really touch on losing my mom you know but I have considered going back to therapy perhaps I will you know perhaps I might talk to you guys about bit more about it and you will be my therapists. Oh I've been rattling on for a while now haven't I? Oh god I'm sorry to have kept you although I must admit it hasn't been as hard as I thought it was going to be talking to you all. I'm glad that I've been able to get some of it out you know because it is hard to talk to other people, to let them see the other side of me, the uh, the vulnerable, the weak side. I don't do vulnerable and weak. I do hard face cow most of the time, you know. I find it very difficult to let people peer inside of me. I, I, I worry, you know, what they'll think, what they'll, their opinions of me will be. And also, you, so you feel bad, don't you, talking about these sorts of things with your friends. Sometimes I think, oh, you know, I don't want them to think I'm a Debbie Downer. I'd hate to think that my friends ever looked at the phone ID and thought, oh, God, I can't pick the phone up to her today. I can't deal with it, you know. So you sort of put a brave face on it, don't you? And press it down with inside of you, pretend you're not feeling the way you are, but um, yeah, it's been good talking to you all, and my mum's 8th anniversary is coming up soon, and I've got plans, I'm, I'm going to take up a huge bouquet of flowers, and I'll hopefully, because we're off work at the moment, being furloughed, I still don't know what's happening about the job, but um, I'm going to go on my own, and stay a little while and have a little chat to her and talk to her. Anyway, I've, I've spoken enough. I mean, look at the time. Oh, crumbs. Um, I've bored you all silly enough. Um, thanks for listening to me waffle on. I, I really appreciate it. And if any of you have any suggestions for me to try and get over this anger that I feel still or if any of you want to share your stories or how you feel or if you felt the same as me or if you felt totally opposite or you know if you want to share your story put it down in the comments I'd love to connect with people and I love talking to you all thanks ever so much I really appreciate it Bye. God bless you all.